Hello, everyone. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Kristen Jowers, and I'm a program coordinator for OneOp. I am joined today by Dr. Nicole Huff, our new project director from the University of Kentucky, who will be moderating the Q&A. It is our pleasure to welcome you all to today's session on helping military families understand the true cost of convenience. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so that you can find your way around. Hopefully you are currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you're unable to see them or have any other difficulties, please email us at contact at oneop.org for tech support. As some of you have already done, we look forward to having you join us in the chat pod for conversation and questions. To embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You'll then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen. From there, click on the chat bubble icon. When typing questions or comments, please be sure to select everyone from the response options drop down menu so everyone is able to view them in the chat pod. Note that the slides and resources are available for download on the event page for today's session. We will be covering continuing education information at the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned at the end if you're interested in continuing education credits or a certificate of attendance. Finally, closed captioning is available for this webinar. You can turn on the subtitles via the Zoom toolbar. Thank you for joining us as we continue our partnership with the Department of Defense and the U.S. Department of Agriculture to expand the readiness, knowledge, and networks of the professionals supporting our military service members and their families. Today, I'm pleased to welcome back our presenter, Dr. Jennifer Hunter. Dr. Hunter serves as the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment as the Director of the School of Human Environmental Sciences and Assistant Extension Director for Family and Consumer Sciences. Dr. Hunter is also an Extension Professor in the School of Human Environmental Sciences. Dr. Hunter is native Kentuckian and graduate of the University of Kentucky College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. She began her career with the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Service in March 2001 as an Extension Associate. Today, her background includes a large cross-section of Extension experience ranging from county agent to state specialist and CES administrator. Dr. Hunter has held primary appointments in the three principal extension programming areas, including 4-H youth development, family and consumer sciences, and agriculture and natural resources, with community and economic development programming incorporated into each of her extension roles. Dr. Hunter has secured more than $55 million in external grants and contracts. Examples of extramural funders include the Center for Disease Control, USDA R Rural Development, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration Rural Opioid Technical Assistance, and the USDA Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network. Over the course of her extension career, Dr. Hunter has authored more than 150 print and electronic publications and delivered over 800 extension educational programs. At this time, I am excited to turn things over to Dr. Jennifer Hunter. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, today, we're going to focus on the concept of cost versus convenience. And over the next 90 minutes, some of the key takeaways or conversations that we're going to have focus on what is the actual definition of convenience, 
Um, how do the different generations approach cost versus convenience? We are going to calculate the cost associated with convenience, um, look a little bit at the cashless effect, managing a digital wallet, the bandwagon effect. Uh, one of my favorite topics to talk about is does convenience equal happiness? And um, then finally, we'll wrap up talking about the dopamine feedback loop. So cost versus convenience is a dilemma that challenges us as consumers every day. I could ask a series of questions which us as practitioners would all answer somewhat differently based on our current life circumstances as well as our lived experiences. So for example, if I was talking about transportation and if I needed to get a ride somewhere, would I choose uh, public transportation, a bus, or a rideshare app. Food, do I want to cook at home or do I want a meal delivery service for dinner tonight? Entertainment, should we stream a movie on the couch and have our own popcorn and soft drink or do we go out to the movies and buy the tickets and snacks for a bigger screen and better sound? Shopping, do I want to go to a brick and mortar store or do I want to shop online? There are certainly pros and cons associated with each choice, and there are also costs associated with each choice, whether it's in dollars, time, or utility. And for the purposes of this presentation, when I talk about utility, I'm going to be referring to the enjoyment gained or lost with each choice. And I'm certain for us individually, as I brought up each of those topics, you thought a little bit differently about what your choice might be. When working with service members, understanding better how they think, feel, and view money is important in helping them understand the true costs associated with convenience. I wanted to start today by taking a moment to discuss different generations and how they may think, view, and feel about both money and convenience. Uh, the descriptions that I'm going to give today are certainly general generalizations and they are not meant to be all inclusive by any stretch. Um, but instead, I hope it helps us frame the conversation that we will have today. We will talk about baby boomers through Generation Z. So Generation Alpha is estimated to have started somewhere between 2010 and 2012. The oldest of Generation Alpha would be 13. They are still very much to be determined and not yet walking through our doors that we may work with as practitioners. A large per percent of the service members that you work with will be younger millennials, also known as Generation Y, or Generation Z, which were born between 1997 and 2012. So first, let's start with money. Baby boomers, um, for them, money is something that is worked hard for and to be saved for retirement. Cash is king over credit cards, and baby boomers tend to be more frugal and cautious with their spending. Generation X view money as something that is earned to pay bills and also to have some fun with. Credit cards are likely their payment of choice, especially in a post-COVID society. But cards are just a means of a tra transaction, and they will typically pay them off or at least try to pay them off at the end of every month. Gen Xers are very savvy and pragmatic when it comes to spending. Millennials or Generation Y, money is something that they believe they need to survive, but they also want to use it to enjoy life. Millennials usually choose to invest in themselves over long-term strategic financial investments. So credit cards and digital payments are certainly a part of their everyday spending, but different than Generation X, millennials tend to struggle a little bit more with debt. Generation Z uh, is typically adventurous with their spending. They are much more likely to, again, use digital and cashless payments. 
So now let's talk about convenience. Again, let me give a disclaimer. This is not to say that older generations have not embraced new technology and ideas of convenience, but more of what I hope to give you is a snapshot in time of what was viewed as convenience products during their coming of age. This is also not picking on any specific generation, but instead just a little food for thought when working with different service members. Um, let's also remind remember that convenience is a relative term that each of us on this presentation today would probably define it somewhat differently or at least how we view convenience. Um, for some people, convenience means have everything delivered to their doorstep with the click of the button. Um, for others, convenience means being able to walk to the nearest store and buy what they need. And then for some others, convenience means not having to do anything at all. So now let's focus a little bit on the generational views of convenience. Baby boomers. Convenience products were a landline phone, a VCR, and a microwave oven. Therefore, today they, they do not mind and may actually prefer driving to the mall or the grocery store. They enjoy reading newspapers and magazines and watching TV shows. Generation X convenience products we're having a cell phone, a DVD player, and a laptop. Generation Xers were the first generation to embrace online shopping and delivery services, but they also like to go out and socialize. Gen Xers are savvy with technology, regardless of what my children might tell you if they were here today, uh, but they also appreciate walking in a store and picking out an item. Millennials, um, convenience products were smartphones, a streaming service, and smart speakers. Millennials like everything to be fast, easy, and personalized. They are always connected, but they also value experiences over things. Generation Z convenience products are having a VR headset, a drone, and a 3D printer. They expect everything to be instant, seamless, and immersive. Gen Zers um, are always online, but they also care very deeply about social causes. Again, hopefully that just set a little bit of a stage that um, from whatever generation that we may be in to whatever generation that we may be working in of having some ideas about how an individual may be thinking, feeling, and viewing both money as well as the concept of convenience. Now I wanna focus a little bit on how much does convenience cost us? It is estimated that Americans spend $751 billion annually on convenience. So examples of conveniences that would be included in that number are ride sharing, food delivery, home and pet services, and subscription boxes. Americans spend the most on home services, for example, cleaning services, lawn mowing, followed by food delivery, ride share, pet services, and then subscription boxes. So I think sometimes when we talk about convenience, especially when we frame this as the dilemma of cost versus convenience, we start to think convenience is always bad. And so to answer that question, is convenience bad? Uh, of course not. Um, one of the primary reasons that Gen Z highly prefers online shopping is so that they can easily apply uh, online promo codes and coupons. So there certainly are examples when using convenience, when using technology could save us money. Um, being able to order food, clothes, pay bills, and even date online certainly has its benefits. Uh, convenience saves time. And theoretically, convenience allows individuals to do and accomplish more, which should result in more free time. So can convenience really save us money? And this is a question that can elicit a lot of responses. So this 
this is a topic that in class with my college students, I will spend at least one full, if not a couple lectures on, just to help them understand all of the convenience products around them and what they may actually be spending on convenience. And so when I ask this question, and uh, especially when individuals are trying to defend or um, support their personal choices that they make, um, I'll get responses such as, well, when I shop online, not only does it save time, but also gas money, which ultimately saves me money in general. Uh, when asked about subscription delivery services, a common response that you might hear is that by not going to the store, I'm not making impulses purchases, which saves money. With meal delivery services, I order less than I would when eating out because I'm not getting a drink or other extras, so it saves me money. And while some tidbit of these arguments may be true in specific settings, for the most part, the choice of convenience is going to be costly. One of the biggest conveniences that I am certain many of the service members that you work with are utilizing is cashless spending or the mobile wallet. And so what actually is the cashless effect? The cashless effect is the likelihood that a person will spend more because no physical money is changing hands. This is not a new phenomenon at all. Um, it has been talked about for years in personal finance, the difference in buyer behavior between spending cash versus spending credit. So um, an example I've always used with my college students is the decision to purchase a pair of jeans. And with this, I was just talking about the difference between cash or credit. And so I would say, if you're going to the mall this weekend and you want to buy a new pair of jeans and you have $50 in your pocket, an actual $50 bill, when you go to the mall, you know that you are limited by the $50 that you have in your wallet with you. So before making that purchase decision, you might go to several different stores. Um, when you're trying on the jeans, and some of us do this much more consciously than others, but you're looking in that mirror and you're saying, how good do I look in these jeans? What do I really think about the fit of these jeans? Because that purchase decision is very meaningful to you because you know once you have made the decision, your shopping trip is over. Um, it, there is also a sense of loss when you are paying with cash. So when I go up to the cash register to pay for the pair of jeans, I have to hand that $50 bill over. Now, there is no doubt that they are handing me the pair of jeans and a nice shiny bag that I can walk out of the mall with but I have also left something behind. And again, that sense of loss factors into our purchase decision. It makes us think more about how much we're spending. When we pay with credit, we are, um, our shopping trip can be extended because we are not limited to the money that we have in our pocket. Um, so we might be limited by how much we have available on our credit card, but we're not limited by the actual cash we have on hand. Also, when you pay with credit, you are not leaving anything behind. You swipe, tap, um, insert, whatever it may be, and then you put your credit card back into your wallet and back into your pocket. So when you leave the store, you have your shiny bag with your new pair of jeans in it, along with everything else that you brought into the store slash mall with you. So again, you process that decision differently. In general, it's accepted that we tend to spend about 30% more when we're paying with cash than, or when we're paying with card as opposed to cash. So forgive me there. So again, we spend about 30% more because we don't weight the decision in the same way that we weight our decision when spending with cash. So this is magnified with the mobile wallet or the cashless effect because you're not even actually having to take anything out of your pocket. Um, the use of digital wallets has increased by almost 90% post-pandemic, 
and Americans sent and received over $7 trillion in cashless payments in 2020. And so certain if we fast forward to today, we would assume that that number has continued to grow. So with given that, we're just going to take a quick poll. In the work that you do, what percent of weekly purchases do you think your service members are paying for in cash? And the poll should pop up on your screen, but if it does not, feel free to answer in uh, the chat. We'll give it another couple seconds here. So the overwhelming response is estimated uh, that A, 21 to 30%. And I do wish that we knew exactly um, in terms of service members, but what I can share with you that um, it is estimated that 41% of Americans in a recent Pew Research Center study said that none of their weekly purchases were made in cash. And so again, 41% um, of Americans said that none of their weekly purchases were made in cash. And seven years ago, that number was at 24%. So certainly you can see the impact of a mobile wallet and the cashless effect. I'll tell you a quick story about my, my son. Um, so my son's actually at one of the service academies. He completed cadet basic training this summer. And when he left for basic training, he was told to have $100 in cash with him. Um, we went to March back to um, see him at the end of basic training. And I said, do you need cash? And he said, I have $97 left of what you gave me when I, um, when I left home. So that was June 20th when he left home. I had the opportunity, I had work travel fairly close and I had the opportunity to pop over and visit him for dinner last weekend. I said, bud, do you need some cash before I leave? And he said, no, I still have all the cash that you sent um, uh, originally with me um, in June. So obviously his use of cash is very, very limited. Now I do see he is spending money. So please do not feel like he is not spending money. He is just not spending it in cash. So the U.S. is certainly moving towards a cashless economy. Um, on my campus, the sporting venues no longer accept cash. If you go to a football or basketball game and want to make a purchase at the concession stand, it will be either um, via mobile wallet or credit card. Um, the salon where I get my hair done no longer accepts cash tips. They use peer-to-peer -peer payment apps to send money. And I'm certain that you can think of other examples in your life of where you have started using um, cash less and less. And again, um, this has certainly been compounded by the pandemic. Uh, the trend towards self-checkout at the grocery store is certainly a push towards cashless society. More or at most, or at least the older ones will still take cash. However, the vast majority of customers will use credit or mobile pay out of ease. I know at our local grocery store, if you try and pay in cash, it's just a pain to get it to feed into the machine. And um, that could be very intentional. Um, the newer kiosks, especially those popping up at fast food restaurants, do not even give you cash options. So as a society, we will trend more and more towards the cashless effect.
So what does this mean um, for those of us in personal finance and how we support the clientele that we work with? Um, so the ease of the digital wallet um, has certainly magnified the cashless effect. I don't even have to carry my credit card around with me now. I can just pay with my phone. Um, a consumer values the digital dollar differently than the actual paper dollar in hand. So as we were just talking about how as a consumer we value credit differently than cash, we certainly value the digital dollar differently as well. Scanning your phone is even less of a commitment than handing someone your credit card. The easier it is to spend, the more likely an individual is to overspend. So um, a few studies that I was able to find, the University of Illinois recently tracked spending habits after adopting mobile wallets on campus. And on average, the transaction amount increased by 2.4% which really did not seem to be that much. Um, but the most staggering statistic associated with their study was the number of transactions increased by 23%. So um, each transaction was not that much more than what the average transaction had been previously, but the number of times that an individual was making a transaction increased significantly. A separate study conducted by a researcher at the University of Toronto on laundry mats in apartment complexes uh, compared payment method, coin versus prepaid laundry card, and how that impacted the decision to separate white and colored laundry. And individuals paying with coins separated their laundry 44% of the time, um, compared to individuals paying with a card, separated their laundry 60% of the time. So it's just interesting how we can see our behavior change when we're not actually paying with with cash. And I do see that there's a few uh, questions in the chat. I will just say we have a pause slide coming up and I'll kind of circle back and answer any of those questions or at least attempt to circle back and answer any of those questions. Um, but before we get to that, I do want to talk a little bit about the concept of coupling. And um, no, I have not moved on to the latest dating apps. The convenience of that is certainly for a different presentation and a different presenter. Uh, coupling is the concept of pain or loss that I described in the gene purchase example. As a consumer, um, you had a high of the purchase, but it was coupled with the loss of handing over the cash. So you mitigated your purchase to not feel an extreme loss. Mobile wallets allow you to separate or uncouple the two experiences. So if you think about um, rideshare apps, there's a lot of research out there about how consumers prefer rideshare apps over taxis. One of the reasons that consumers will cite a preference to rideshare apps um, is because a taxi has a running meter. And so you see exactly how much each quarter mile is costing you when you are in a taxi, which makes it much more difficult to enjoy your ride. With the Rideshare app, you click one button before you get in the vehicle to pay for the ride. And so it becomes out of sight, out of mind, and you can sit back and enjoy the ride. Now, y'all could have probably a lot of other reasons on why um, Rideshare may be preferred over taxi, but one of the leading reasons is that you're very mindful of what a taxi ride is costing you, and you just become more anxious about the time that you are in the vehicle. Um, the more transparent the payment method, the greater pain is felt from coupling. So age is um, definitely a driving factor when we think about the use of cash. So Gen Z has a very, very high 
um, adoption rate of mobile wallets. And uh, Next Gen Personal Finance estimates that more than 80% of 14 to 21 year olds have mobile payment on their phones. And so that's 14 to 21 year olds. That, that includes our teens as well. Um, millennials also have a very high adoption rate in the upper 70%. Okay, so we're going to recap a little bit here in terms of managing a digital wallet. And um, one of the first, you know, when working with service members, especially if you notice that they are struggling with um, cashless spending and that you see some spending leaks, which and overspending um, from mobile wallets is um, help them come up with some strategies. And the first is rather obvious, but sticking with cash. Um, it may not be realistic or probable in today's society, but obviously the more we spend in cash, the um, we certainly do feel that pain or coupled um, with the expense. You can also encourage them to embrace mobile technologies to offer support. And a great example is going to be the Sense Mobile app, a free money management resource that has a number of tools to help service members assess their financial readiness and includes an actual financial assessment. The Sense app can help military families come up with a spending plan, pinpoint focus areas, and guide military families through short and long-term financial goals. Um, if you're looking for more information about the Sense app, App, I think there'll be a website that's dropped into the chat pod for you. Um, other strategies that can be put in place, the individual can lower their credit limits, which would reduce their ability to overspend. Uh, one of my favorites is to link your mobile wallet to your fun money account that as you all know uh, that it's very easy when working with your bank or credit union to have different accounts set up that you manage through through an app and that you could have one that's a vacation account or a holiday spending account. You can create a fund money account. You can directly link your mobile wallet to that fund money account. And then you know exactly how much you have in there. And so it's a way for the service member to put limits on themselves about how much they actually use their mobile wallet. Um, set a spending limit for spontaneous purposes and purchases, and this is something that you can do again with that fun money account um, from number four, but the amount will be based on, dis on disposable income, the higher the disposable income, most likely the higher the limit, um, but any purchase over that limit, an individual should wait 24 hours prior to making the purchase regardless of the payment mechanism. So um, in our household, this is $100, that um, we have a $100 spending limit and that if we are considering an item or a purchase that is over $100, we obviously need to consult um, with the, uh, with. I need to consult with my partner and make certain that he is um, okay with that purchase and agrees that it is good. And then um, also kind of waiting a time period because sometimes, um, we see something and it sounds great. And then 24 hours later, we've cooled off and maybe it doesn't sound quite as great to us. So it's up to each individual or family to figure out what that spending limit is. And then of course, always reviewing good financial habits. So we're just gonna take a quick pause here and kind of circle back up. I'm gonna scan down through the chat and see if there's anything that we have missed. And Jennifer, one question did come in about cashless payments. And so if you saw uh, the trends in cashless payments changing anytime soon, um, with many businesses charging service fees for using credit or debit cards, some businesses giving a discount if you pay in cash uh, versus charging a fee to use cards. Do you see that impacting um, the decision to use cashless payments or to return to using cash? I think we will continue to see cashless payments grow. Um, now, I do think that, um, and this is true in, in our household as well, that when there is a discount for paying in cash, 
um, we will likely pay in cash, but we are of a different generation. So especially for the younger service members um, that, that you work with, they are in most instances going to trend towards that convenience of using their mobile wallet or their cashless effect. Um, I also think that large companies and um, credit cards will really drive and push kind of the cashless economy. Um, certainly for small businesses, it is a struggle. So I do think you will consider continue to see those incentives from small businesses uh, to encourage the use of cash. But I do think that it is a trend that we will continue to have and see grow. Okay, and we're, ha we're having some more come in and we'll continue to monitor those as we go. And some of these longer questions we'll come back to towards the end of the webinar. All right, sounds great. Thanks, Nicole. Um, so obviously, when working with service members, we want to meet them where they are. And as we've been talking about mobile wallets and cashless payments, that um, obviously they're using mobile technology. And so how is it that we can capitalize on that? And I think we really want to encourage the benefits of using mobile financial apps and just reviewing um, some of those benefits with them. And sometimes they may not know, they may not realize all the access that they have at their fingertips, or they may not really know how to utilize that information to help them be better financial managers. Um, so again, very basic, but they can view their account statements, view account balances, transfer money between accounts, deposit checks, pay bills, create and track budgets, view monthly spending, create monthly spending forecasts, create savings goals and track progress, and receipt tracking. Um, some of these we're going to talk a little bit more as our presentation goes on today, but just helping to remind them that as they embrace technology, that one of the conveniences that comes with technology is having this information very readily accessible to them. So, so far we have talked about convenience in terms of ease, specifically focused on the ease of payment. However, happiness or utility that we referenced at the beginning of the presentation can also be derived or perceived to be derived from convenience. For example, I am happier because I do not have to cook dinner for myself. I am happier because I went through the drive through at the, at the coffee shop. I'm happier that someone else is going to clean my bathrooms. I am happier that I do not have to mow my own lawn. I'm happier with the subscription service to my gaming system. That the concept of utility is the measurement of happiness or satisfaction that a person gets from a certain action or behavior. Um, for example, our cafeteria here on campus has oatmeal raisin cookies. There's not a whole lot in our cafeteria that I would really recommend to someone, but the oatmeal raisin cookies are really good. And um, I eat lunch there lots of days, mainly because it's extremely discounted for employees of the university. So um, it's, there's a lot of value in having lunch at the university cafeteria. But um, as I finish my meal, I will always go and get an oatmeal raisin cookie. And most days I get two oatmeal raisin cookies. And as I stand there and I stare at them, I think about three oatmeal raisin cookies, but I have to exhibit some level of self-control and cut myself off at the two oatmeal raisin cookies. But I'm certainly getting utility enjoyment from having those oatmeal raisin cookies. Now we all measure utility differently. And for many on this call, y'all do not like oatmeal raisin cookies. They are not always a fan favorite. If I had said chocolate chip or sugar cookies, a whole lot more of y'all would have been on board with me as I was talking about my enjoyment from oatmeal raisin cookies. 
So you may not really understand the utility that I derive from eating the oatmeal raisin cookies. Um, it's important to remember when working with service members that utility is subjective. So you may not understand their perceived satisfaction or joy generated from a certain action or behavior. Um, so then let's also think about, and I'm really enjoying your all's comments on the cookies, but um, what happens when I eat too many oatmeal raisin cookies? My joy or my marginal utility decreases. I have learned that two is my cutoff. Um, that two is just really going to be my sweet spot. But after two cookies, even though the cookie is exactly the same as the first cookie that I ate, my satisfaction with the cookie starts to decrease. And so this is known as the concept of diminishing returns. Each additional cookie that I eat after two, I'm less and less happy with. Um, so helping a service member recognize um, what is their point of diminishing returns on their utility is very important because they may not really recognize um, with cookies. It's fairly easy because your stomach starts to hurt and you start to feel like you have a sugar high and you're not going to get through the rest of the afternoon. But with some of our spending decisions, it may be difficult to understand um, when we start to enter into diminishing returns. If I think about streaming services, well, if I have one streaming service, two streaming services has to be better. What about three, four, five? Well, it's not possible for someone to watch all of those streaming services. So at a point, they're not getting near as much return or enjoyment from the additional streaming services. So theoretically, convenience provides us with happiness for all the reasons that I talked about just a minute ago. It should make life easier. Um, we've all heard the saying, though, that nothing in life is free. So helping service members understand the true cost of each increment of their happiness or utility is key to behavior change. Um, food is a great example to demonstrate the increased use of convenience products. So food away from home spending was 16% higher in 2022 versus 2021. Um, in 2022, food away from home spending was at $1.34 trillion dollars compared to one one point oh five trillion dollars in food at home spending. Um, one of the largest contributors to growth in this industry is the online food service market, but it's just become easier. And as things become easier, more people are likely to use the convenience. Um, the online food delivery service market is estimated to, to have reached $21.6 billion in 2022. Now, I do think that there is no doubt that the pandemic changed some of our spending behaviors, that um, individuals may have gotten food delivery services that they never would have gotten before, but then once that they had tried the service and experienced the service, then um, they decided that they liked the service and therefore has encouraged them to continue to spend. The statistics for food delivery services um, are somewhat difficult to come by, but by general consensus, Americans spend approximately $37 per week on food delivery. So that's per individual. Um, as recently as the year 2000, so not that long ago, maybe before um, some of the service members you work with were born, but still not that long ago, a restaurant meal delivery was dominated by pizza and Chinese restaurants. However, over the last two decades, and again, um, further escalated by COVID, food delivery services have changed how Americans eat, especially young adults. Prior to COVID, food delivery services were experiencing steady growth of approximately 8% per year. However, during COVID, uh, it doubled. New convenient habits can be very difficult to break. 
in a post-pandemic era, consumers continue to spend on food delivery services. Millennials and Gen Z have established a clear preference for convenience of prepared meals versus cooking at home. And meal delivery comes at a premium. Depending on the delivery platform and the restaurant, customers may be paying up to 40% more for their meal. And I'm just going to note one of the comments popped in there that an individual worked with a client that had spent over $1,100 in August uh, on um, one of the meal delivery services. And I would be curious to know, did the individual recognize that they had spent that much before you had worked with them and added up their actual spending? If I give you an example, um, if you think about a $20 meal, that the delivery fee is most likely going to be two to five dollars and then the driver tip is going to be another two to four dollars um, plus some restaurants are going to have a commission for the restaurant platform so just because the restaurant is utilizing whatever meal delivery service that they may be paying extra and passing that on to you that easily that twenty dollar meal could become twenty four to twenty nine dollars before paying the service commission to the restaurant. Um, so definitely costs considerably more than just going out to eat in general. Um, I do think that uh, showing examples is valuable when working with service members and you can walk through some of these examples with them um, that the average cost if we say is $35 that if um, you order meal delivery four times per month, so they're spending $140 a month or $1,680 per year. You can do the same with coffee, um, that uh, at a popular coffee chain, the average amount spent per customer is $4.05 per visit. Uh, so once per week, that's $210 a year, twice per week, $421 a year. Daily, it becomes over $14, nearly $1,500 a year. And then compare that to the average cost of homebrewed coffee um, that's cost between 16 to 25 cents per cup. And so if you did that daily, it would cost $91.25 um, per year. So just helping individuals understand what they're actually spending can really and truly be a moment of realization for them. Often convenience um, is associated with comfort and without careful planning, convenience behaviors can become daily behavior. So if you buy a cup of coffee on a regular basis, it becomes more and more difficult to get up in the morning and make your own coffee. If you routinely stop on the way home to grab dinner so you don't have to cook, it be can become increasingly more difficult to make dinner at home. The more you use online grocery apps and delivery, you become less inclined to stop at the grocery store and do your own shopping. Given that individuals are deriving utility from these behaviors, so I'm happier when I don't have to cook dinner at night, um, they're more likely to repeat the behaviors. And so repeat behaviors equal habits, both good and bad. Given both Gen Y and Gen Z are motivated by more than money, it may also be helpful to point out the impact of convenience behaviors beyond just financial cost. And I have seen y'all pop some of these up into the chat box, but convenience behaviors can have negative effects on health, environment, uh, social relationships. So again, recognizing that um, it is not just costs may help make an impact as well. Examples are just that, they're an example. Sometimes it can be difficult for an example to resonate. However, encouraging the service members that you're working with to keep a spending diary or tracking log can help you identify convenience purchases and convenience habits in their spending decisions. At minimum, you want to encourage them to keep the diary for one week because we all spend differently on the weekends than we do during the week. A month certainly would give a more realistic picture than a week. 
Utilizing actual expenses can make the exercise much more meaningful. This is also a good time to revisit financial goals of the service member. Are they saving for a car or a down payment on a house? How much quicker could they reach their goal if they had an extra $1,500, $2,000, et cetera, per year? The spending diary can also be a very helpful tool in setting a realistic budget. A spending diary is also key to identifying spending leaks. And spending leaks are those small, often unnoticed expenses that drain your budget and prevent you from saving more money. Uh, they are like a slow leak in a tire that you do not notice until it's too late. Spending leaks can be anything from a daily coffee habit to a subscription service that you do not use to an impulse purchase at the checkout counter. Spending leaks may seem harmless, but they can add up to a significant amount over time. And we've already talked about coffee and food delivery services, but there's a whole list more that we could discuss. Um, vending machines. So our vending machine here on campus, if I wanted to go get a drink out of it, is $1.75. If I did that twice per week, that would come out to $182 per year. Um, fast food four times a week at $10 a meal is going to be over $2,000 per year. And my list could go on. Um, again, the unused subscriptions and memberships, um, subscriptions to newspapers, magazines, especially digital ones that you never or rarely use. It's very easy to have digital subscriptions and forget about them, and they definitely become spending leaks over time. Um, one thing that I think is is likely significant with the audience that you work with is convenience fees for ATMs where um, they are much less likely to use cash. That means they're much less likely to have cash on them. And if they do end up someplace where cash is required, um, often there is going to be an ATM set up there. And um, often individuals do not realize that those ATMs typically come with very high service fees or convenience fees for um, being at, let's say, a concert venue, I think this is very common at, that um, the whoever the entity is that has placed the MT ATM there is certainly making a profit from that machine being there and just making individuals aware that the convenience or service fee for your ATM is not always equal. All right, how do we plug our spending leaks? Um, so tracking spending, the spending diary is a great tool to do that. Um, I love to do it on paper. I don't know that paper is realistic. And so finding a mobile app or mobile technology that makes it easy for the service member, helping them categorize their expenses so they can see which areas they are overspending in, identifying those common leaks, and then taking action. Uh, again, strategies that you've likely already discussed with your service members, but just reinforcing those, setting a budget, using cash, canceling the unused subscriptions, seeking alternatives, um, being able to walk away both online and in person. So identifying when this is an impulse decision or an impulse purchase, or maybe this is not a purchase I should make today, even if the deal is really good or the sale is really good. And then also looking for ways to change behavior patterns. Nicole, do we have any questions we need to circle back up to? Jennifer, I'm out here opinion on service members frequenting places that offer military discounts. Uh, do you think the return on investment is worth it? So um, I might pause that one till the end because I have slides coming up that talks about sales or deals. And I would um, put the military discount in kind of that same, same type area. Um, and I think it's is it, a, is it a purchase, is it a choice that they would make um, without the discount? Is it something that is really needed? Does it fit with their financial goals? Are all questions that should be asked? But again, we'll talk about that a little bit more on an upcoming slide. All right, perfect. Then I think you're good to continue. So 
should convenience dictate our choices? Um, no, convenience should not dictate our choices, but there are certainly times in life we all need to choose the convenient option. Um, convenience should be used wisely and responsibly. And I do think that you should discuss with clientele if there are specific times, days of the week, or regular events in their schedule that make the trade-off for convenience worthwhile. So last year, it was Tuesday nights in our household. Uh, the timing of my daughter's soccer practice and my son's wrestling practice made it nearly impossible for us to get a meal on the table for the family at home on Tuesday evenings. Um, some weeks I would just tell my son to go pick something up for himself on his way home while I was on the other side of town with my daughter. So utilizing convenience um, made certain that everyone was fed. However, I had also planned for it in our budget. Um, but I will say at times I did have to fight the temptation on other nights when our schedules might have been hectic and made family dinners difficult but not impossible, I did really have to fight the urge to not say, let's just grab something. Um, if the service member you are working with is successful in maintaining their spending diary and they're already keeping a personal calendar, you may be able to work with them to overlay the calendar with their spending diary to determine if there are certain events or triggers that cause the convenient spending behavior. Um, and then you may be able to work with the service member to identify lifestyle alterations, which result in savings. So we had planned convenience on Tuesday nights. This year, we, we do not have that because we only have one kiddo at home. So um, our world can revolve around her schedule most of the time. And so we're better able to plan. But it's figuring out what are those stressful times in the service member's life that is encouraging them to make the convenience convenience decision and how is it did they plan for that? I now want to talk a little bit about the dopamine effect. Uh, dopamine is a chemical that acts as both a neurotransmitter and a hormone in the human body. Dopamine is produced in the brain from an amino acid and is released by nerve cells to send messages to other cells. Dopamine plays a role in how we feel pressure pleasure, and satisfaction. Your brain makes dopamine when you're happy, excited, or in love. I have noticed that we do have a few uh, family therapists on our, on our um, participant list today, and they are very, very well informed about the dopamine effect in terms of love. So basically, dopamine is the reason why you cannot stop scrolling through memes or been watching streaming services or texting your crush. Um, dopamine is like the ultimate reward for your brain, but it can also be the ultimate trap. So spending money can act as a reward that triggers a dopamine release. Um, for me, I am keenly aware that bargain shopping creates a dopamine release for me. I love the thrill of finding a good deal. However, I also recognize that I enjoy the thrill of the deal so much that sometimes it leads me to overspending. Money and dopamine are known to have a very complex relationship, and money can bring us both pleasure and heartache. A dopamine release feels good, so individuals are motivated to repeat the activity, which is known as the dopamine feedback loop. For some individuals, spending money is an activity that can, tr that can trigger the dopamine feedback loop. Impulse shopping is also a trigger that can um, trigger the dopamine feedback loop. So convenience um, makes impulse shopping very, very easy. Uh, recently, as I was waiting on a doctor's appointment, I bought a new pair of pants. I had not been thinking about buying a new pair of pants. I certainly did not have the need for the new pair of pants, but I sat aimlessly scrolling on my phone. I saw something I liked. It was, quote, a good deal, and before I knew it, I clicked on the item, entered my size, clicked pay, and now they are at my house. As soon as I clicked pay, I did think to myself, 
Why did I do that? Um, impulse shopping directly relates to the dopamine factor. I derived joy or thrill of the deal while I sat it waiting in the doctor's office. There was also, this was also likely a response to stress. I was trying to occupy my mind with something different than the actual doctor's appointment. Impulse shopping is typically an emotional response to some form of external stimuli. Um, often I see this on a college campus uh, with midterm grades. Typically in, in class, I will do a lecture on impulse shopping about the week before midterms. Um, especially for freshman students that um, this might be their first real shock to what their grades are going to look like in college and some will utilize some retail therapy to make themselves feel better after they receive their midterm grades. Um, so typically there is something that encourages us as consumers to go out and make impulse purchases. Um, as professionals working with military families, think about examples of external events that might elicit an emotional response. Um, certainly a deployment or a PCS, but also smaller everyday examples um, that service members you work with may face, such as struggling to master a specific skill. Impulse shopping can certainly have negative consequences on an individual's financial situation. Impulse shopping can lead to overspending, accumulating debt, and regretting purchases. I like the comment that shopping gives a sense of control back to a person under stress, and that is very, very true. Although gauging spending on impulse shopping is somewhat difficult, it is estimated that impulse purchases account for 40% of e-commerce shopping. Promotional messaging or targeted advertisements are estimated to generate $4.2 billion in revenue. Impulse shopping occurs both online as well as at brick and mortar stores. Um, estimates of monthly spending on average uh, impulse shopping ranges anywhere from two to $300 or up to $3,600 per year. Changing behaviors and habits is difficult and an accurate spending diary can help recognize impulse shopping behaviors as well as the triggers. I do want to bring note to you all that in the chat pod, there has been a linked drop to recognizing spend more pricing strategies is one way service members can make informed choices. So stress is certainly a leading driver of impulse spending, but so is hunger. My mom always said, do not go to the grocery store hungry. You will come home with a cart full of items that do not make sense. Well, like most things, my mom was right. Hungry customers do spend more but it is not necessarily just at the grocery store. The University of Minnesota School of Management conducted a study to measure the impact of hunger on shopping decisions. And the findings indicated that hunger directly influenced the acquisition of non-food related items. And this study was somewhat unique that um, they had individuals that came in that had fasted for a certain period of time so that they more or less knew that everyone had some, um, was at some level of hunger. And um, then they used cake and binder clips and they uh, assessed the difference in the shopping decisions to purchase the binder clips by those individuals that were given cake and those individuals that were not given cake. And so I've always associated hunger with the decisions I make at the grocery store, but I had not really thought about it in terms of um, decisions that I would be making on non-food related pro um, products. The study also examined the relationship between um, mall shopping and the degree of hunger. Finding hungry mall shoppers spent 64% more than shoppers with satisfied hunger. 
So maybe a good tip is that um, they all go to the mess hall and get get a good, a good meal before shopping. So how to limit impulse spending. Um, we want to set a budget and track spending. So knowing how much the individual can afford to spend and how much they have already spent can help them avoid buying things that they do not need or that they cannot afford. Um, again, we've talked a lot about the spending diaries. So recognizing the times that you are most tempted and how is it that you can help them maybe avoid or seek an alternative event behavior during those times. Unsubscribe from marketing emails. The less solicitation that an individual has, the less likely they are to make impulse shopping decisions. The same with social media accounts. I'm certain that you all are aware, well aware that as you scroll through social media that um, it can trigger kind of the impulse or tempt you um, by shopping and make you feel like you're missing out on a great deal or a trendy item. You want to avoid browsing online um, or actually in person in stores when you're bored, stressed, or unhappy. There are times when you will most likely, these are the times you're most likely going to make an impulsive purchase decision to cope with your emotions. Uh, you want to encourage them to find other ways to relax or cheer themselves up, such as reading a book, exercising, talking with a friend, etc. We've talked about the dollar limit or wait before you buy. If you see something that you want to buy, don't buy it right away. Instead, wait a day or two and think about whether you really need it, want it, can't afford it. And you might want to, um, they might find that the purchase that they were going to make was truly, uh, truly a fad and that over time that fades away or they may find a better deal somewhere else. Uh, create an envelope for impulse purchases. So for those of you all that have been working in this field for a long time, um, the, the envelope system is one of those tried and true uh, recommendations in terms of personal finance that you put helps you manage your budget by labeling each envelope and putting a certain dollar amount in that envelope and then being limited to spending within that envelope. But help them create a digital envelope, especially if you see a lot of cashless payments. And again, you can do this through kind of how you manage their, they manage their accounts online, but create that envelope specific for impulse purchases so that there is some limit on the spending. Um, plan ahead with an estimated 65% of impulse purchases occurring at brick and mortar stores. Um, develop a plan prior to shopping and be very mindful of sales. Sales are the largest contributing factor to impulse shopping decisions. Um, this is where I would add in the military discount uh, as well, that the purchase needs to make sense. It needs to make sense in their budget. It needs to make sense with their financial goals, and it needs to make sense for their household. And the discount may be really great, but does it make sense in general? Um, and then there's also certainly comparison shopping. And so can they compare across the different discounts and make a more informed decision? Um, reward yourself for resisting the urge. And this might be an interesting strategy, but um, helping a service member understand that there is some benefit to resisting the urge to impulse shop um, may make them less likely to do so. So every time they resist buying something on an impulse, uh, they can put that money into a savings account or a piggy bank or whatever it may be. But then as that money grows over time, they could use it for a larger purchase or something that is on their goal list or that they need or want and to save for the future. And then obviously, don't forget to eat before shopping. And Nicole, any questions that we want to circle back up to? 
think uh, you're good for now. Um, okay. There is a question about um, if you could, you, you've referenced your college teaching and that if you have before the webinar or we can follow back up on this, recommendations for um, upper level undergraduate textbooks on personal and family money management, a publisher and author that you would recommend. And so we can circle back to that one, um, yep. but your recommendations have been solicited. Oh, okay, yeah, we'll definitely, that's one we'll kind of cover uh, at the end or I can share with you to, to share out. Great, thank you. All right, the bandwagon effect. Uh, I want you all to think about, have you ever seen a long line at a restaurant and thought, we should go there and eat? You might not have known anything about the restaurant ahead of time, but just the fact that so many other people were eating there, it made you want to eat there as well. Um, the bandwagon effect is a psychological phenomenon that makes people do something just because everyone else is doing it. Uh, spending money on trends or fads is common, and we are all likely guilty of this to some extent. I always love a presentation when I get to throw up a good um, supply and demand curve. See, one of my favorite economic principles is the law of supply and demand. A change in taste can directly impact the demand curve. So as consumers jump on the bandwagon and spend based on trends, they shift the demand curve out, changing the equilibrium point or price. Therefore, trendy items tend to cost more, demand is high and straining supply than the actual value or worth of the item. Um, as I provide the following example, please know I am not judging or commenting on anyone's um, purchasing decisions. Referring back to an earlier slide, we all make decisions based on the utility of the decision. This is just a good example of the bandwagon effect. So please know there is no judgment on my end at all. But I can think of a very popular tumbler right now that sells out as soon as the product hits the stores or is restocked online. And this tumbler or um, water bottle um, has had strategic um, marketing and has heavily utilized social media influencers and bloggers. Uh, the word of mouth phenomenon has been a great example of the bandwagon effect with this product. Um, to the extent that when my 11 year old came home from school and asked for one, she told me that there were certain girls at school that would not talk to you if you did not own this specific tumbler. Um, today, we do not have time to discuss the preteen middle school drama, but it does clearly demonstrate an example of the bandwagon effect, especially since I walk around, as, as I walk around campus or sit in meetings, I um, am certain to see as many of the popular tumblers as my daughter sees at school every day. Um, side note, we did not get one for her because that is not a good reason to make a purchase. So we had that conversation. Um, but um, and then also, just so you know, drinkware was a $28 billion industry in um, 20. 22. And as we talked about what drives purchasing decisions, especially for um, our younger adults, um, the, the drinkware industry has been fueled by demand for eco-friendly, eco sustainable options. Um, but we as consumers, as we increase demand um, and we put strain on the supply system, prices tend to go up. Um, so in terms of thinking about the bandwagon effect and questions to consider prior to making a purchase, um, do I really like this product or service? Am I buying it just because it's popular? How often will I use this product or service and for how long? How much does this product or service truly cost? Can I afford it without compromising my budget or savings? How does this product or service align with my personal values and goals? 
What are the environmental and social impacts of this product or service? So just encouraging the individuals that you work with to think more about the purchase decision that they are making. Um, so similar to the question before of is all convenience spending bad, is spending on trends bad? The answer is not always because um, obviously we're human. The key is recognizing that we have a tendency to be swayed by trends and to put steps and processes in place to help us make sound financial decisions within our budget. So now a question to you all, and you can pop this in the chat. Uh, why might service members choose to get on the bandwagon? So can you think of examples that you have experienced in the work that you do that um, where service members choose to get on a bandwagon for a specific product or to go with the herd? And so um, as I look at the responses that are are coming in, they're very, very similar to what we would see with the general population in terms of peer pressure fitting in, um, maybe coping with a low self-esteem, wanting to be liked uh, by others. I think one of the things that may be a little unique about some of the comments focuses on, on rank that if you see individuals of a higher rank um, utilizing a certain product or doing a certain thing or whatever it may be, that um, that might be a good behavior for, for you as well. Um, we are all humans and we are certainly subject to the bandwagon effect. It is just um, recognizing um, and then thinking through those questions about is it a good decision for us or not, becoming more aware as a consumer. The bandwagon effect is driven by FOMO or fear of missing out. So in a nutshell, fear of missing out is following the crowd as opposed to making an individual assessment or evaluation um, of a decision. Because as humans, we all want to belong. We want to fit in with our peers and our counterparts. So as y'all just pointed out on the previous slide, Fear of missing out can impact everything from small purchases to big purchase. Uh, I can think about a recent concert ticket frenzy that is a great example that um, this particular artist has a very, very loyal fan base. Um, fans immediately scooped up all the tickets available during the pre-sale. And as you might remember, there was lots of news um, with this particular artist about um, the ticketing website, that the site crashed, that people were waiting online for hours for tickets. Um, a huge deal was made about the tickets and the access to tickets. And um, Although the artists already had a very large fan base, as the ticketing fiasco gained more and more momentum in the news and on social media, it placed greater pressure on the tickets. People knew just how hard the tickets were to get, which instinctively made people want them more, even if they were not huge fans prior to this particular tour. As the concert series started, the media frenzy continued showing fans camping out in front of stadiums, again further perpetuating fear of missing out for consumers and driving the secondary pricing for tickets even higher. Um, that as society in general, the media, social media, whatever, gave more and more attention to this artist that just by natural instinct, more and more people wanted to go. Secondary ticket prices became completely unreasonable and people were still paying it because they had a great fear of missing out. Factors that typically drive um, fear of missing out is loss aversion, regret or fear of regret, insecurities, um, this phenomenon does tend to decrease as age. So the older we get, really and truly, the less we tend to care 
or have fear of missing out. Um, however, when we're working with Generation Y and Z, it is an important concept to recognize and discuss strategies on how to manage it. So we want to encourage the service members you work with to be mindful of the situation, to take a step back and assess. So as mentioned previously, FOMO um, comes at all price points. If that's cell phones, wedding planning, vacations, house, cars, et cetera, the list goes on. So having the individual ask, am I making this purchase because it increases my utility and aligns with my goals and vision, or am I making this purchase because of my peer group might help them make a more informed and better decision. So I do want to call um, attention to the, the chat pod as well, that additional resources um, will be dropped in here um, in terms of um, FOMO customer reviews and offering free promos and upgrades that might be helpful for you to use when working with your service members. Um, I'm also going to kick this back to you all now and ask what are realistic steps to combat fear of missing out or what are strategies that you have used when working with service members? So getting a similar cheaper version of a product, so a knockoff or, or a dupe um, certainly is an option. Presenting realistic op options, um, having a good heart to heart. Why is it that you want to make this decision? Um, how meaningful is it to you? coming back to their values. And I think that that's very important in the conversations that we have with individuals that so much of our spending is value-based spending. And that it typically, if we align our spending with our values, we tend to meet our financial goals and um, make sound financial decisions. Does this, does this decision move you towards your goals? The 24 hour wait period. Oh, I, I like this one that just popped in about recently working with a client, having them analyze their Liberty trip options, and then looking at the financial situation and deciding um, which of those options were most desired and being able to choose from those options. And I do think it's important that people like to have options, that they like to feel like they have some choice, and sometimes it's just providing guidance towards the best choice that can be made. Okay, so as we wrap up today, I know that um, there's additional details to share with you all, but we might have a few minutes for questions. Yes, we do have just a few minutes, uh, Dr. Hunter. If anyone has any uh, burning questions, you can drop them in the chat pod or in the Q&A box. Um, and um, if you could speak, so there was some some chat going back and forth about do you do you see us ever becoming a cashless society? Will will convenience or other other things push us towards a cashless society? Oh, well, I'm. I certainly do not have a crystal ball. I do <laughs> think that we will continue to see trends towards a a cashless society that for businesses 
uh, and corporations, banking, et cetera, there are a lot of benefits that will drive and continue to encourage and push a cashless society. I'm not certain that I personally, as Jennifer Hunter, um, imagine a world without without cash in it, but um, I do most certainly think that we will con continue to see the trend towards um, a cashless economy continue. Um, and again, it's for many of the reasons that, that we discussed today that the, the younger generations really prioritize the, the convenience. And I will admit, I am very guilty of um, my mobile wallet as well, because I don't like to carry things around with me. And um, if I can just have my phone and not have to bring a purse or a wallet or stick something into my pocket, uh, it just makes life easier. So that's something that personally I have to monitor myself is, the, is utilizing my mobile wallet, because uh, I am very, very guilty um, if I'm just running out of having my driver's license in my vehicle and just taking my my phone with me. Um, and then we did uh, some tips, maybe. So we talked about goal setting as um, as important and maybe one of those strategies um, to combat uh, FOMO or other things. And so do you have just any last minute tips for how to encourage uh, financial goal setting among service members to maybe reduce impulse buying or reduce those spending leaks? And I do think this is hard um, for for younger um, young adults to be able to think forward. It, it, my son's getting ready to turn 19. He does not necessarily have big goals in front of him right now in terms of financially. He's not thinking about buying a house, and he's he's not thinking about replacing a car because he does have a running vehicle that he's not even really allowed to use right now, right? So um, he doesn't really have those big goals that he's working towards. So one of the conversations I've I've had with him of well, what are what are our smaller goals? Um, uh, is it being able and you know leave was mentioned earlier or or is it when you have a pass, do you want to be able to go and do whatever it may be with your friends, what is that going to cost you? That's not a bill mom and dad are going to foot. How is it that you save towards that? So figuring out what seems like realistic goals for the individual and their current life stage, but then also having the conversation with them about working towards the future. So setting those short, medium, and long-term goals and maybe helping provide some vision to them for those um, five year plus goals of well, what, how might your life stage look different then? And are there things you should be saving towards now to help make life easier for you in the future? So really and truly, it's just having a conversation, um, especially our, our younger adults seeing into the future is a little bit hard because they don't have as much life experience behind them to look as far into the future. Very excellent tips. And thank you so much, Dr. Hunter. And we are um, uh, almost out of time. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it back over to Kristen, who will wrap up our webinar. Thank you, Dr. Huff. And thank you so much to Dr. Hunter for a wonderful webinar. It was great to have you back with us. For those of you who may have missed it, Dr. Hunter presented a webinar with us earlier this year on helping clients inflation-proof their budget. I'll drop a link to that event page in the chat so that you can go and check it out. You'll also want to check out DOD's online resources available for personal financial managers and counselors from the FinRED and Mill Spouse Money Mission websites to the Sense mobile app, e-newsletters, and social media. Access the financial well-being assessment, conversation cards, media kits, spending plan worksheets, the net worth tracker, and so much more. I also want to invite you all to our next webinar, Ethical Compass, Guiding Military Families with Integrity on October 17th at 11 a.m. Eastern until 1 p.m. Eastern. Practicing ethics in personal finance promotes financial well-being, fosters trust in financial relationships, and contributes to a positive and responsible financial culture within individuals and society as a whole. 
Join Dr. Gutter and Dr. Tyler Mackey to define ethics, including the military standards of ethics and ethical guidelines from AFCPE and FinCERT. This two-hour session will include discussion of case studies and an application for financial professional practice, and we will have continuing education available for that session as well. I'll drop a link to that event page in the chat. For those who want to obtain CE credits for this session, we will drop a link to the webinar evaluation in the chat. You can also access the survey by navigating to the event page and clicking on the purple continuing education button. Our current session is approved for 1.5 CEU credits for financial professionals, including accredited financial counselors and certified personal finance counselors, board certified patient advocates, board certified case managers, certified family life educators, those certified in family and consumer sciences and certified personal and family finance educators, social workers, licensed professional counselors, and licensed marriage and family therapists. Certificates of attendance are also available. While completing the webinar evaluation, we would sincerely appreciate specific suggestions for future webinar topics that could be used directly in your work with service members. At the end of the evaluation, you can choose the correct link for your accreditation. Depending on your CE type, you may have to take a post-test, which you must pass with an 80% of or higher in order to receive a certificate of completion by email. Some email providers will direct the certificate to your spam folder, so check there if you don't receive the certificate within 24 to 48 hours. If you have questions about CEUs, you can email me at oneoppersonalfinance at gmail.com. Go to oneop.org to access free CE opportunities, blogs, and other resources. You can also follow us on social media for daily resources and one-op programming updates. As we are winding down our time together today, we will leave the slides up for just a moment so that you can collect any links that you need from the chat. If you have questions about CEUs, please email me at oneoppersonalfinance at gmail.com. The recording for today's webinar will be available on the event page in the next 48 hours in case you'd like to go back and review anything and so that you can share this information with your colleagues. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and we will see you next time.